when I started looking at this from a scientific point of view, we were mapping out the mycorrhizal network in Douglas fir forests. So it's kind of like you uncover the forest floor and you make a map of all these connections between the trees. And we started looking at it mathematically using graph theory and the patterns of the network in the forest was exactly the same as a biological neural network in our brains. Welcome to Sing for Science, the show where musicians and scientists talk about music and science. I'm your host, Matt White. Each week, we'll talk about a song by our guest artist and how it connects with our guest scientist's area of expertise. This week, we'll be talking with the band MGMT and forest ecology professor Suzanne Simard. Suzanne pioneered the breakthrough study of how trees can actually cooperate and communicate with one another through the forest understory. The title of this week's episode on the podcast is A Family of Trees, Uncovering Underground Networks in Our Forests. Hello, Suzanne and MGMT. Thanks for coming on the show. Hello. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. So, Andrew and Ben, I think it's fair to say that I've wanted to have a conversation like the one I hope we can have today ever since I first heard your song. Because in the chorus, you sing about a family of trees. And I, I remember that That was the first thing that struck me about the song because it's such an arresting and evocative lyric. And I guess subconsciously, I'd always always associated trees with something that's nurturing and maternal in as much as they provide shelter. But when I heard you sing that lyric, it inspired me to think about trees kind of with human qualities. And based on what I hope we hear from Suzanne about her work, I don't think that's such a big reach. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask, because I mean, quite honestly, I I still don't entirely know what, obviously what your intention was when you'd written it. And I, I want to know, I I don't think I do either, but I can, I can try to help. (laughs) Well, I, I do want to know that, but I'm also (laughs) curious to know, have you ever heard theories from other people about what you meant? Like both ones that are on the nose and ones that are pretty far out. You know, it's funny because that's, that's MGMT's most, I would say it's our most popular song. And it's also sort of our oldest song. Um, ben and I wrote it mm. when we were freshmen in college. So I, I've heard a lot of different ideas of what the song's about, but specifically about that chorus line, not much mm. discussion. Um, I, I'm happy to talk about it because I've been kind of trying to figure out what it means for a long time. <laughs> yeah, please do. Let this be your forum to, to, to just riff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that, like you said about trees having human qualities, um, in, in this case, I was thinking about trees being very old organisms that kind of see humans' lifespans come and go. And it kind of like the idea that there was a group of, of trees that had a, a mutual desire to be haunted by a, a, a human ghost or something like that, some kind of quirky thing that a tree family decided to do. And I don't know how they ended up getting a ghost into their, their, uh, you know, zone, but that was the, the idea, maybe. <laughs> so you guys were, you were in Connecticut at Wesleyan when you wrote it? We were, yeah. And is that, is the camp, is that like fairly idyllic New England up there? I'd say so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's kind of like what you think of when you think of like a Northeastern liberal arts college, you know, brick buildings and Mm-hmm. nice forests in central Connecticut. And, and um, yeah, Ben and I became friends as freshmen and, and spent a lot of time exploring the, the area local to the college campus and going on walks and uh, finding strange little stores and stuff like that. Um, it was probably, you know, fall of 2001 when we started this song, I think. I don't oh, really wow. Remember. Yeah. I love this song. I mean, the video scares the shit out of me, but I love this song. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's really interesting that you wrote it that long ago, because I mean, it to me, I kind of associate it with at least the the music part of it. I associate it with a lot of other reemergence of kind of of dance music and combining with rock music. But you mm-hmm. had written it so much longer before that was all happening. Yeah, uh, Ben and I are both really bonded over pop music but kind of in the vein of talking heads and mm-hmm. uh, 
who else? It was like the the Pixies and and kind of oddball pop music. Mm-hmm. And Prince obviously was a big one. But I think that the the lyrics on this one definitely had an influence, like a David Byrne kind of influence. Yeah, where there's sort sort of this uh, inscrutable quality to it that like something that touches you, but but uh, you know, doesn't really make sense on the surface or something. <laughs> well, it does exactly exactly that. And the first half of the chorus, which we should talk about, because so the first half of the chorus is control yourself, take only what you need from it. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, so long as we're talking about the natural world, I, I feel like if there ever were a, a PSA anthem for, for the Natural Resources Defense Council, I think this would be it. Yeah, that's true. And, and you know, a lot of people, um, going back to people kind of bringing an idea of what they think the song is about, a lot of people have kind of taken that environmental angle and, and mm-hmm. with that line in particular saying it's kind of like a, a conservationist um, kind of approach or something I, mm-hmm. I don't know but um for me it was more like a, a uh, without getting too deep or whatever it was more like a, a buddhist thing but it was kind of okay a result of i think a psychedelic experience if i'm being honest um you know kind of like a when you get to a certain point where you have you kind of just have to let it go so the, the control yourself line is actually i i feel like a little bit it's like saying the opposite or something like that, like like to have the opposite effect in the same way that uh, David Bowie, I feel like lyrically, sometimes he'll say something that totally seems like it's the opposite of what he's trying to uh, get across, but somehow he still gets across that, that thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I don't no, know. I'll, I'll go there with you. So the you're saying like in the context of a psychedelic experience. Yeah, like like um, I'm thinking of the, the David Bowie song, Quicksand, I think, um, when he's like, don't believe in yourself. Don't deceive in belief. It's it's kind of like uh, almost laying out the thought process of a psych of someone having a psychedelic experience where there's a lot of like doubt and kind of mm-hmm. thoughts circling. So you're alternating right. between these like human attempts to hold on to something and then this more transcendental thinking that's trying to just make you go with the flow or something. Right. So even though it sounds like something that's laden with self-doubt it's actually somehow self-affirming and in, in i think surrendering so yeah. to the process yeah so can can i ask was there i mean was there like mushroom foraging in the <laughs> wilds of connecticut for you guys um i mean not not in like the food like edible mushroom foraging that's not what i'm talking about <laughs> no um i mean i think we we foraged you know psilocybin mushrooms from different college dorm hallways i don't yeah <laughs> like we weren't we weren't going out into the woods to to find them um, right but maybe yeah. once you had harvested them <laughs> from a dorm you might have ended up in the forest yeah, yeah we that's, used to that's go, for sure what was this uh, we, we would go to this place wadsworth falls mm-hmm. uh, a bunch of times and the devil the devil's hop yard was another little park that we would go oh, to oh my <laughs> God, yeah. everything is just so stark in New England. It is. <laughs> and very old and kind of haunted feeling. I know, absolutely. I, I grew up around there. And I actually, it's funny, I went camping once in a little town near Middletown called Cobalt. Mm-hmm. And I actually was, I'm just remembering this now, that I was actually w- woken up by mushroom foragers at about six in the morning. <laughs> but I'm sure it was kind of like for more the exotic and the edible. Yeah, yeah. But anyhow... I didn't know if you were going to come back at me with like, oh yeah, these uh, forestry buffs have approached us and talked to us about the song and think that it means this and that. And so I wanted to know when you wrote the song, did you have, did you know anything about forestry science when, when you wrote it or, or any of these concepts that Suzanne has worked on? I don't think, I, I mean, Ben, I don't know, maybe you did, but I don't think I had that, that kind of knowledge yet. I think not. Not more than like a general sense of, you know, the, the forest is vast and mysterious and holds mm-hmm. a lot of secrets, but, but, uh, you know, that <laughs> nothing, nothing more concrete than that. Yeah. Some sort of pagan thing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because I think, um, the, one of the things that I, I get when I hear Suzanne speak about what she's studied, I definitely get the sense that we were coming to a place where we look at the forest more as a, a singular organism more than a a bunch of different ones. 
so with that, I'd, I'd like to bring Suzanne into the fold. Suzanne, could you speak to that? Yeah, it's fascinating hearing you, listening to you talk about about what you were thinking at the time and I, um, when you wrote the song. I think that, you know, people have this innate connection to forests. We're, we're actually descendants of trees <laughs> along the evolutionary pathway. And I think that even if you don't fully cognitively understand the origins of the song, I think that our own deep connections to trees, which are genetic and uh, and also cultural, and, and you talked about the mystery of forests, that's deeply cultural. And when I started doing my research in forests, it's because I could see that, you know, forestry or the industrialization of forests was moving away from our our deep, heartful connections to forests. And I think that, you you know, as you described this sort of just a visceral outcoming of the song, that it came from your heart, your gut, speaks volumes about, about really the how we've moved away and now moved back t- towards a better understanding of forests. And I have to say that my, my own, as I grew up in forests in Western Canada, you know, I was a child of the forest. I just grew up in them. And when I became a forester and was watched in like horror as, as we sort of flipped sort of our very basic understanding at the heart level of forest into something that made money and was part of the economic machine and was degrading our forests, I thought, you know, that was what drove me to start asking questions about the family of forests. <laughs> you know, how, mm. how do we become, how are we connected and how do we co- become so disconnected and how do we reconnect? Right, because you had you started with a stint working for the logging industry, correct? I did. So yeah, I mean, I mean, going back to you know, I said I grew up in the forest. My grandfather was actually a horse logger, and his father was a logger, and all my uncles and great uncles, and my of course the women in the family were all part of that too. Um, and so I grew up, you know, as people that lived in the forest and lived from the forest, but in a very you know, sort of a I don't know, very sustainable way. I, I don't know if it was sustainable back then, but it was, you know, they just took what they needed to, to raise their families. And then when I I, I decided I, I wanted to understand forests and became a forester, uh, that's not what I was taught. And not when I worked in the forest industry, because I did get a job in that, you know, in the, in the late 1970s, early 80s. Um, and that's when clear cutting was really starting. And I just was mm. like, horrified, you know, that this was not mm-hmm. how I understood people interacted with forests in, a, in a, a respectful and honorable way. And so that's what drove me to start asking questions like, how are these, how do these forests work and how are we making them not work? Right. And one of the things that you were tasked with was creating these uh, very homogenous monocultures, right? That So to root out all of the, the less profitable trees, Yes, and and I have to say that that is still that's still the philosophy in much of forestry around the world today, and and is that the root of many problems that we're seeing in our current, you know, in the current issues with climate change and the fires in the Amazon. Um, it comes back to you know the industrial way of converting old forests, which are complex systems of many, many trees and plant and animal species working together to create a a beautiful system into something that's very simplified and basically Mm -hmm. pared down to, you know, those species and individual trees that are big and fast growing um, that bring Mm -hmm. economic value. You know, we've started saying, okay, we can grow a forest like that. And that's what I grew up in, you know, what I became part of that industrial machine when when I was a, a young undergraduate student and looked at this and so I thought this is wrong headed but mm-hmm. yeah that that is that is the philosophy it's alive and well in the world today and it underlies many problems that I think if we step back and say actually this isn't how the forest works that we can solve some of these problems mm. so it's a, a monoculture actually invites disease into the forest is that right yeah, I mean, it, that's right. It, it's like diversity um, means that there's a variety of species and structures, and different species have different tolerances to, to pathogens, for example, or 
invading insects. Or So if you have a variety of species, if there is some sort of pathogen infecting a species, then other species will kind of take over and, and fill in those gaps. But also there's this, what I look at even more than that, is that there's a synergy between species that they actually mm. connect and communicate about their health, um, their, their, even their, their pathogen loads, and they can increase their health. You know, they can share resources to enhance the health of their neighbors. And this confers into, you know, a resistance against diseases. That It reduces their vulnerability to these damaging agents. So, so diversity, just by a, a sheer numbers, just to recap that, from a sheer numbers perspective, you know, if you've got many species, there's a low likelihood of something killing the whole forest. Mm. But at the same, same time, it's even more than that. It is, it is the synergy between species that enhances the health of the forest. And, and that's something that you observed between different tree species, right? It's birch and fir trees that cooperate, right? Yes, that's where I started because, you know, in, in my work, they in where I lived, they were, you know, killing the birch trees. And today they still kill these birch trees and the aspens and the cottonwoods and the maples because they want to grow, you know, fast growing conifers that have always been very profitable. Mind you, that profit has come from what are called old growth species that didn't grow up under this sort of more industrial mechanism. But um, mm. yeah, so they, so when I was working on them, they were spraying and cutting and getting rid of the birches. And, and I saw that the disease among the remaining conifers, which were the Douglas firs, um, which were supposed to be bringing profit to the company, were actually getting disease themselves. And so I wanted to understand like what, what we were kind of undercutting the health of the forest by taking out these foundational trees, the, the birches, and then that's what led me to the discovery that actually these trees are connected with each other and communicating about about their health, and that that connection was really the foundation of all the sort of the microorganisms that interact together to that create a healthy soil and a, a healthy forest. And could you describe? <clears throat> I mean, two things. One, what what constitutes an old growth tree, and and two, could you please break down for us how this network works, just both in transferring. Uh, nutrients, but also in transferring messages between trees? Yes, two important things. So old growth forests, people have debated what is an old growth forest for a long time, and it's still under debate because it's from an ecological po point of view, but an economic point of view. And so, so let me just break that down a little bit. So from an ecological point of view, it really just means a primary forest, a forest that didn't wasn't planted or didn't arise from, you know, the cultivation by human beings. So mm -hmm. um, generally they're old forests, you know, the iconic old growth forest would be like where I grew up. Um, it's the old rainforest, the big towering cedars and hemlocks and firs, and they t can be, you know, a thousand years old or 2000 years old. I mean, the oldest forests in the world, the bristlecone pine forest can be 5000 years old. Um, so they really are, you know, chronologically very old. But you can also have old growth forests where the trees don't actually naturally grow that long or live that long. They can, you know, for example, there's lodgepole pine forests that only, you know, naturally live for a, a hundred or two hundred years at the very most, and then they burn and they start over again. Even at that old age, you would consider those to be old growth forests. Um, although, you know, people don't usually associate a young successional stand like a lodgepole pine is old growth. So it's been debated. And the reason it's important to the economists is that, you know, when they say, oh, well, if the conservationists say we need to protect old growth forests, they'll say, well, what is an old growth forest, right? So if they can sort of reduce the definition of an old growth forest to maybe include only those, that iconic 2,000-year-old forest, then all these other forests don't qualify as old growth. So it's very important discussion. Mm. from a conservation point of view and trying to, yeah, trying to save these forests from logging. It's kind of like how McDonald's calls ketchup a vegetable. Yeah. Yeah. It's a twisting of, of reality, I think, to serve a purpose for financial gain. Sure. Your other question is, you know, how, how do these trees, you know, how do they connect and communicate? So there's various ways we've known about trees being connected 
through time in space for a long time, but not really understanding it very well. So I think we all know that, for example, that trees can graft together below ground. The roots can graft together if they're of the same species. An oak tree can graft to another oak tree of the same species, and and they can be like one tree. Or you can see in the forest where one tree might grow, and you know the stem of it will grow into another, and the phloem or the cambium of those trees will graft together as though they're one tree. But what I discovered was that, and people have been thinking about this for a while, was that there's this whole suite of organisms below ground, a whole city of organisms, if you will, that support those trees. It's like you think of in a human being, we think of ourselves as these individuals, but we're actually a microbiome. We're full of millions of bacteria and other small organisms that make us. And they actually govern all our processes. It's the same in a forest. There's all these organisms in the soil that support those trees. And one of them is called a mycorrhiza. And a mycorrhiza is just a fungus that associates with the root. So mycorrhiza, myca fungus, root, rhiza root. It's a symbiosis where the tree and the fungus get together and they provide each other with resources it's a mutualism, so they both benefit. So the tree invests in these fungi by providing carbon because the, the fungi can't actually photosynthesize their below ground. They don't have leaves. And what the fungus does for the tree in return for this gift is it grows through the soil and picks up nutrients and water and other information molecules from the soil and bring them back to the tree. And, and then the tree gets its nutrients, its nutrition that way. So they, they need each other. And all of the trees all over the world are dependent on this association. Mm. And so... So how long have we known that much? Uh, I'd say it depends on what we call knowledge, but um, I think the first sort of literature that came out was from the late 1800s. Okay. Um, when people were looking under microscopes and saying, oh, you know, that was when the first idea of a mycorrhiza was in the late 1800s, 1882, I think. Okay. But... If you look at indigenous knowledge and the teachings of indigenous people, they've known about this association for many thousands of years. They talk about it in their oral culture and, and how the fungus supports the forest. So when we talk, how long have we known this? Well, we don't have a good under understanding of that. Where Western science is concerned. Yes, Western science, which considers itself the beginning of science, but that's actually not true. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's actually many First Nations where I live in, in Western Canada and British Columbia. I don't want to say the wrong number, but they're in the tens, like so 20 or 30 First Nations in British Columbia alone. Many of them have the same philosophy of or similar philosophy of how all of the creatures in the world are connected as one. And you know, this understanding of fungi and trees in the forest are part of that knowledge, that this connection that we are all one, we are all out of this earth. I think even if you if you speak of the uh, indigenous people in Eastern North America, all over the world, that that philosophy of oneness is, is universal. And so I'm working with um, some f First Nations, we call them First Nations in Canada, the First Peoples, trying to understand the linkages between, well, the socioeconomic, ecological linkages between forests and people from thousands of years of living on the land. Even, you know, the connection between salmon and fungi and trees, for example, that's one of our specific projects that we're looking at these intimate linkages between the people and the forest. So we're working with the Haida uh, on Haida Gwaii. We're working with the Hyaltsik Nation, the Simsan Nation. And then in the in the interior of British Columbia, there's uh, several nations, the Sinaiaks, the Kootenai. So, I, I, you know, there's many nations. And so I don't want to particularly draw out one in particular because we are working with several. Um, but they're a very important part of, you know, the setting of the, the questions that, that I've been asking, we've been asking is, what is their scientific underpinnings of this knowledge that we are kind of rediscovering with Western tools? Way, way, way late and almost like we better discover this really fast because we have dismantled so much with our ignorance and, and lack of knowledge of connection that I'm working with them and very actively and mm -hmm. trying very hard to bring people in, in forestry up to speed so that we can correct some of these big mistakes. 
You'd, and I saw also specifically with the salmon connection, could you mention what you discovered about the salmon in the tree rings? Yeah. Well, first, I think I should go back to the other question you had that I didn't quite answer. Yeah. So in this symbiosis, um, what I discovered in looking at the disconnection between birch and fir and the disease among the fir, I wanted to know how we were severing that relationship and what was causing the disease. And I started looking at the mycorrhizas these beneficial fungi, thinking the answer lay there. And I discovered in my inquiries that these fungi actually linked the trees together. And I had a hunch already because there had been some primary work done in Europe, actually, where they, there were some laboratory study, a, a laboratory study showing that little pine seedlings could be connected below ground by their roots through these mycorrhizal fungi. And I thought, wow, this could, if this is happening in, in our forest, in real forest, not just in the lab, um, this connection could be the starting point of the health of the forest. And so when I started looking, lo and behold, I found, and over the years confirmed using advancing techniques in science from just looking to using molecular techniques and, and discovering this vast network of interconnection of trees, not just of the same species or the same age trees, but of different species and multi-aged uh, forests. And through this network, this fungal network, and you can think of it as like the internet, messages are passed between trees. And what I first started working on was, you know, one tree that may be bigger or healthier would and in this case, um, my birch trees were bigger and healthier than my fir trees, were sending uh, more nutrition to, to these, uh, you know, sickly or, or not as healthy trees. And then as I looked more and more, I found that this resource sharing, if you think of things like water and nitrogen and the fertilizers of, of the forest, the phosphorus, that all of these things are moving back and forth between trees and they're shuttling them around below ground the effect being that the health of the forest has actually become balanced. So old trees will support young trees, for example, especially if they're of the same kinship. And that's where this idea of the family of trees, there is a scientific basis for that, even though in the song, Andrew and Ben might not have thought of that at the time, but their visceral connection to the forest, somehow that was drawn out of them. <laughs> and, and we can get into that, but I think that's fascinating. I'm kind of curious if there are these kind of um, complex networks that interconnect different organisms in other plants besides trees. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are. Because I mean, I mean, obviously, you know, fungi, I, I assume that happens in other mushroom cultures, but, you know, what about just other plants? Yeah, all but five families of plants in the world form these symbioses with fungi. And so they're, they're, wow. they're called obligate symbioses, meaning that they can't live their lives and reproduce and carry on generation after generation without associating with fungi. So almost every plant that you can think of, except for the ones, which is interesting, some of the ones that we cultivate in agriculture are not mycorrhizal, but, but all the other ones are. So when you're going in the, walking in the woods looking for mushrooms, a lot of those are mycorrhizal mushrooms, and they're associated with all the plants in the forest. There's different species of fungi that associate with different species of plants, but that's okay. You know, and some of those fungi are specific to that species of plant. Some of them are what we call generalists, where, you know, maybe that maybe a lily plant will be connected to a maple tree. We know that actually happens. Wow. <laughs> so that's so cool. Yeah. All the plants that you see in, in a natural plant community are mycorrhizal associated with these fungi. Wow. That's wild. So they're passing nutrients, but they're also passing messages. Mm -hmm. Is that right? That is something that, you know, I wish we knew more about, but it's sort of a nascent science. And uh, people are, are looking into this in more and more labs around the world. But, you know, in the work that I've done and other people have done is that some of these messages, so, so I can talk about two kinds of messages we've investigated in my lab. So one of them is when a tree becomes injured or diseased, that tree will be communicating with the neighboring trees. And so we can, you know, in the lab, we can injure a tree, we can infect it, we can cut its needles off, we can, you know, generally harass the tree, and the tree will have a response to that, a, a biochemical response. It, all these hormonal cascades get triggered. And those hormones end up moving through the mycorrhizal network into the, 
into the other plants which perceive these messages. They they listen. And what we found is that when they get those messages, they upregulate their own genes to produce sort of defense chemicals or up, upgrade their defense mechanism so that they don't also get attacked by that disease. That's specifically what we've looked at. We know in other labs around the world that this communication about diseases also happens through the air. So plants will also send chemical signals through the air. The special thing about sending signals below ground in the mycorrhizal network is that they can really direct the signals to whoever they want to hear it. So let's say there's an uh, some kind of fatal organism that's killing a lot of different plants. And let's say you want your species to survive, you know, those trees will direct their messages to their own kin or their own species. And then the other species might not get that message because they're not linked into that network. And so then they can succumb to that disease. So we've, we found that sort of thing. And then the other kind of message that we have not unraveled very well, we just know the consequences of, and that is the kinship messages. So we know that, for example, that trees can recognize other trees, their species, and whether they're of their own kin, like of their their own seedlings, their own progeny, they can recognize that through these mycorrhizal networks. And we don't completely understand what that messaging is, but we know that that exists because when we cut off the mycorrhizal network, those messages just don't go through. So those are two examples. It seems as though some of what you're observing, which I think is is distinctly a law of nature that our survival depends on our cooperation across mm-hmm. all species. And there's something about that that just seems counter to what I learned about the theory of evolution and survival of the fittest. So in mm-hmm. the forest, for example, that you know one of the larger trees would would let, I, I would assume would let the, the smaller ones, die off. But perhaps I guess what what the work suggests is that it realizes it's to self-preserve that it actually helps the injured tree. Is that? Right? Yeah, I, th- I think, you know, we sort of intermix theories of evolution with theories of ecology here. And so, in, you know, Darwin's theory of evolution is survival of the fittest, that the fittest genes will survive and reproduce. And that theory has been tested and proven and expanded upon. And I think that there was a lot of additional hypotheses that were also proven that cooperation is also part of survival. So Lynn Margulis, for example, a famous evolutionary ecologist, a scientist, discovered sort of like symbioses between the microorganisms and, for example, other cells of eukaryotic organisms. Like the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes basically entered symbioses and that led to the evolution of higher order plants and animals. Sorry, could you define those two, what, what you just mentioned that I can't repeat? Yeah, the, like the eukaryote organisms are like the higher order organisms like humans and animals and trees. They have, are multicellular organisms with multiple organs. <laughs> They're complex organisms, whereas prokaryotes are bacteria. And it was a symbiosis between bacteria and early eukaryotes that led to the development of trees and plants and so on. Okay. And that, you know, th- that when w- when that discovery was really made or understood better, then the idea that of evolution expanded. And it was a very difficult fight within the evolutionary literature that, you know, it wasn't just about competition, but it was also about cooperation. Both of them are important. Mm-hmm. But the idea of survival of the fittest and competition is still a valid it's still a valid theory. It's just that it's there's more to it than that. And in ecology, so in the realm of ecology, which I think you're thinking of, where you know trees or plants will compete with each other and the bigger one wins out, that happens too. But there's also cooperative things going on where like what I'm talking about is these networks where things are exchanged and really forestry sort of hung on to that competition is the reigning interaction that that we need to manage in forests. If we just get rid of the competition, you know, then the winner can take all. We'll get these big, great big trees. Forester call them big pumpkins. You know, we'll just all get these big pumpkins and then we can cut them down and start over again and grow more big pumpkins without the weeds that we don't want. And I think that that philosophy came from agriculture, but it also came from evolutionary ecology, which was kind of like a, a riff off of what Darwin was thinking. He wasn't thinking about I don't think about 
competition in the sense that we manage plant communities to get rid of the competition. He was thinking of it more from an evolutionary perspective. Do you see that yeah, distinction? Okay. Absolutely. You know, and I, I, I'm so glad we're recording this now because it, it seems like such an incredible opportunity to be speaking with you about your discoveries during this time of reckoning that nature's having with our species, but also forcing us to reconcile within our species. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yes. I, I think what your your discoveries really speak to that. I, I mean, I, I I don't know how to open up this can of worms, but I feel as though obviously we're not going to save this planet without interspecies cooperation. It, it's a law of nature. You're you're seeing it in the forest, you know, and it's something that we need to actually embody ourselves and our survival is dependent on it. I think that, you know, I always say the forest is quietly waiting for us <laughs> to catch on. The trees are gentle giants that are looking at us going, when will they figure this out? And they survive, they persist, and ultimately nature will win, right? Yeah. And I think that I think the tipping point for us will become when we realize that we are just one part of nature. We are not separate. We are not like the Donald Trump of the forest, right? We, we're not mm-hmm. going to reign over and rule the roost. We are just part of this ecosystem. We're an important part of the ecosystem. And I think that also is something, you know, mm-hmm. preservationists would say, well, we need to separate, keep it, you know, preserve the forest, be separate. We need to get away and, and let it do its own thing. But in fact, humans have evolved with forests you know, and have always interacted with forests, always, and and have shaped forests, and forests have adapted and shaped alongside of us. So, as when we get back to the our roots, so to speak, and understand that we are a fundamental, necessary, ecological part of the evolution and development of forests, and only one part, that we are all in this together, we are all one. When we get back to that, we will hit a tipping point and start healing the planet. But until we do, I, I think that it's going to be a struggle. Yeah. I, I had a question for Suzanne. One of the things that I was really fascinated about learning about your work was the implications for our understanding of what is intelligence. And mm-hmm. I was wondering if there's any crossover between your research and neurology or, or artificial intelligence, if you if you talk to people who study that stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's a rich area. I think part of the problem is that we don't see trees and nature as intelligent and forests as intelligent. And, and we think of ourselves as intelligent. You know, humans have intelligence, other things don't have it. But as scientists start looking at, including us, at, you know, what is intelligence and what, what aspects of it do these other organisms have, you start, those lines really blur very quickly. So for example, you know, in our brains, in neurobiology, we have, our brain is a neural network, and that network has certain properties that are, you know, have been studied and defined. There's certain patterns where neurons have hubs of neural activity, and then there's the neurotransmitters that run through these, the neurons and axons that create intelligence or thought. Those, it's interesting, those patterns and chemicals are actually in the forest too. <laughs> mm. So, sort of like the physical, physiological mm. underpinnings are, the, are basically the same. Even the neurotransmitters, 80% of the neurotransmitters in our brains are called glutam, are glutamate. Most of the tr- neurotransmitters tra- that are running through mycorrhizal networks are glutamate. And so, it's the same chemicals, the pattern is the same. And the the outcomes of communication through these networks are similar, right? You have a signal and a response and a change in behavior at the forest level. And so when people talk about intelligence and a lot of people will go, oh, you know, it's just, you know, it's just crystals and healing and whatever. But actually there is a scientific basis that we can trace to physiology and the physical aspects of the networks. All those tools are there and all of the behaviors are also, or almost all of them are there. There are some distinctions for sure that people can debate, but the basic patterns are the same. God damn. <laughs> That's bananas. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. When you said that at some point long, long ago, humans and trees share uh, uh, like a, D- a DNA or something 
Is that what you? Yeah, yeah. We're saying so at that point in time, whenever it was, however many was it like a, millions of years know, ago? <laughs> millions and millions of years ago. What was the, what were trees like then? What was it? I mean, are there were there trees alive then that are still around today? There, you're getting to the edge of my knowledge of of the chronology of evolution of man. <laughs> But I, one thing I, that's interesting is that when life emerged from the sort of the microbial soup and from the oceans onto the land, the archaeological evidence is that when when that happened, and then these land or you know, cyanobacteria and photosynthetic machinery started up, the, the evolution of photosynthetic cells, chlorophyll, and or, those organelles, it happened at the same time as those first fossil records show that those organisms, those first eukaryotic cells that were able to develop into photosynthetic organisms were mycorrhizal. They had to have right. an association with the fungus in order to get enough nutrients from this very inhospitable, rocky environment. Right. Yeah. No, no, this makes a lot more sense in my head. I was just kind of hoping in some crazy way that you could be like, oh, I actually, I'm, I trace back to a cedar tree. I have cedar, yeah. I'm, you know, 14% cedar yeah. Or yeah, something, you know, like kind so of like a cool. 23 and me kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like that that brings up that you asked the question about salmon and trees. Just because we haven't looked doesn't mean things don't exist. You know, what we're studying is too is how the mycorrhizal fungi facilitate the transfer of marine nutrients from salmon into trees. So there was a discovery made about 20 years ago that there are salmon salmon nutrients inside cedar trees and in the plants associated with those trees in the forest. And so the salmon migrate into the along their migratory streams, the bears and the wolves and the eagles prey upon the salmon. They bring the salmon into the forest, the salmon decays, uh, those nutrients seep into the forest floor and they're picked up by the trees. And then they, that nutrient, the salmon derived or the marine derived nu nutrients from the salmon reside in the tree rings of the trees. And we can actually take cores of trees and look at how much salmon is in the tree rings. Mm. And the reason that people were able to figure this out is because when salmon are migratory between the oceans and the land, and when they're out in the ocean, they become enriched in an isotope of nitrogen called N15. It's a heavy isotope of nitrogen. So there's a lot of that in the marine environment, so they become enriched. And so when they come into the land, where it's mostly N14 in the plants, then we can actually use that N15 isotope signature to figure out how much of the N, the nitrogen, in that tree came from the salmon that migrated from the ocean. You know, that was a special tool that, that was discovered and allowed us to make that discovery of fish and trees. But what is there to say that there aren't other organisms on land in the trees as well? Right? Anything that, that basically lives and decays and decomposes and goes back to the forest is going to be living in the trees. Did you see Midsommar, any of you? I love that movie so much. It's really good, isn't it? Did mm -hmm. you see that, Suzanne? No, I didn't. Oh, man. It's one of the scarier films I've ever seen. And it, I think the, the entire film is shot in daylight. Am I right? Oh, and, and what happens? Well, the what happens that what's pertinent to our conversation is there's a long story short, uh, this group of graduate students get lured to a midsummer celebration in Sweden, essentially within this commune cult. So they have this huge dead tree that's laid on the ground that I think they bury their dead inside it, right? Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. Ben, was it you that said or Andrew that said that you liked it? Yeah, that, that was Ben. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I haven't seen it. So, um, but you can spoil it. It's no, I don't want to spoil it, but I'll, I, I'll just say that okay. things turn really sour when there's kind of like the, the fall staff comic relief character among them is drinking beer and he takes a leak on the ancestral tree <laughs> where all of their dead are buried inside. And I'll leave it at that. Things go south for him very, very quickly. <laughs> this is a horror film, Suzanne. So, I mean, it's, <clears throat> It's pretty grisly. But the point is, is it would seem that this culture really, really took this idea of decaying people and living inside trees and ran with it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you a story that is true that, well, it's not a horror story at all. I was actually in Seattle 
which is Seattle was named after Chief Seattle. And I was at this longhouse doing some interviews um, with the Snohomish Nation. And there was the great-great-grandson of Chief Seattle. His name is Ken Workman. We were sitting in this longhouse made of cedar, and Ken talked about how he grew up in these forests right around the longhouse. And in the in the Coast Salish people, that particular nation, they buried their ancestors in the trees. And so, and this was actually when when colonization happened, they outlawed this this cultural practice of burying their their grandparents, their grandmothers, you know, people who died in the trees. So, in the burial of the people in the trees, of course, the people, I'm sure there was like amazing ceremonies, and I and I've seen photos of fish, of course, drying in trees, but I've never seen of the people being buried in the trees. But of course, as time goes on, the the, the people decay, and their remains end up in the soil. And then the tree takes up the remains of the people, and it becomes a cycle. And so we're sitting in this longhouse, and and Ken said, "You see these cedar planks, all you know, that makes up this longhouse. Those are my ancestors." And and I just, I mean, at that point, like I just felt this huge thing go through me, like this spiritual oneness that I'd never felt before. And I thought that is so cool. You know, the movie you talk about is a horror movie, but it's actually mm-hmm. <laughs> doesn't have to be a horror movie. So, would the practice was, would they hollow out a, a part of the tree and put remains in there? No, I think, okay, so I don't, I, I don't know enough to, to speak to it properly, but what my impression was um, from listening to Ken is that they, they had platforms that they built in the trees and the branches, and they laid their, their ancestors to rest on those platforms. Wow. May I ask what was the purpose of of your doing this interview and who was interviewing who? I can't remember who was doing the interviewing, but the purpose of it was they were exploring the ideas of how do we re reforest the urban environment of Seattle to increase its resilience to, you know, flooding and fire and the calamities that come on cities. Okay. You know, um, that, sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, I was just going to say that relates I I wanted to ask a question about reforestation and I was reading about how recently in Europe they're starting to use, I think it's called a Miyawaki technique that's imported from Japan. That's like a kind of these micro forests with lots of biodiversity. And I was wondering if through your research, how, how that's informing new ideas for reforestation based on like preserving the, the mycorrhizal networks. This is something that's near and dear to my heart. And I try to, to implement what what we've discovered about connection in forests and mycorrhizas into forest practices. And I know that the urban ecologists, urban foresters are trying, you know, they contact me regularly to ask about, you know, how how to implement this in their own forest, the connection. In urban areas, it's really hard because urban areas are highly disconnected with roads and streets and sidewalks and the soil is bad. And so they have to rebuild from the start and, there are ways to do it, but it takes a huge effort. And I think that this idea of the microforest is, is a great idea to get the diversity in there and the connections. In the practice of forestry, which is more in the extent you know, world and out in the hinterland, there's also lots of room for improvement. And one of the things that I do, and, and I've got this project called the Mother Tree Project, where we are saving the hubs of the network. So the big central points, you know, I talked about the patterns of neural networks you know, in forests, if you can conserve that network identity or that pattern, then in theory, you should be able to regenerate it because all those principles of nurturing young trees through the network all can come into play. And so what I'm trying to do is trying to convince, and I think we're getting there slowly, to, to move away from clear cutting, which takes away the sort of those structures and those historical legacies, those mother trees, and gets rid of them. Instead of getting rid of them, which are the nurturing element of the forest, the protective element, save them, save some of them, and then nurture the forest to renew around it. And that will, it does all kinds of things we found out. It increases resilience to fire. Like the, the forests don't burn down as quickly. They regenerate into a more diverse forest and a, a genetically and species diverse forest. They're more carbon rich. They're more biodiversity rich. And so, yeah, these principles can be taken and, and applied in a really meaningful way. And it's not rocket science, right? It's just, it's more about convincing 
the landowners and the the governments that you can do this and you should do this. If you're participating in some kind of urban renewal project, how do you in, encourage politicians and leaders to actually implement what you're doing? Like, I mean, is it about buying buying up empty lots? And I mean, are these? I don't know enough about the Japanese technique that you're talking about. Is it? I don't either. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, is that something that <laughs> I just I just read about it the other day, and it sounded really interesting. So is that? But is so is that something that you could actually do in an urban center, Suzanne? I think you could. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I say I talk to urban forestry people or urban designers. They they try to contact me and I've always had not had enough time to work with them. But I know that they're really interested in this. And what you can, you, there's all way, kinds of ways that you can create connection in, in an urban setting. And so it is all about connection, right? And And it's about having hubs of activity that connect to other hubs. So activity being like a a diverse garden, for example, or a diverse park with trees in it. And how can you connect it to another park that's maybe down the street or in a different street? You can create avenues of connection by providing the right kind of soil and corridors and tree corridors. You know, the same principles of, of, of landscape ecology apply at a smaller scale in urban settings. And so you start small, like with everything. Start small with good principles and good and a good plan, and you can grow that network and start with a place that's already whole or close to whole, and you know or buy that land and create plant and and pull that ecosystem up by its bootstraps by maybe bringing in healthy soil or cultivating healthy soil, cultivating native species and and letting them grow to old ages. And then, you know, maybe buying up corridors of land around it or saying, you know, in the city streets, convert them from sidewalks to boulevards of trees that are, are diverse and can be connected below ground by these mycorrhizal fungi. And then, you know, have it move linked to another park that's, you're doing the same mm-hmm. thing. So you it takes effort, but it's not impossible to do. Yeah. You know, I just thought about how a, a few years ago, I I performed, I went to this summer camp in a, a really small community garden on the Lower East Side in, in Manhattan and was playing guitar for this summer camp. And the founder of the camp was telling me that Pete Seeger was really involved in what he was doing. Like he, Pete Seeger was really obsessed with city gardens. And I mm-hmm. guess maybe as a result of his being a part of the, you know, post-war generation, his, I think it came from this idea that if like there's a nuclear Holocaust, it's going to start with community gardens. That's how we're going to rebuild, mm-hmm. you know? I think it was the COVID we're seeing that, right? Mm-hmm. People are going back to their gardens. You know, my garden is healthier than it's ever been. <laughs> yeah. We're going back to our, you know, what we can do at a smaller scale and connecting and, and that's, it's kind of like a nuclear holocaust, isn't it? I mean, we've got this pandemic and we have to deal with it. And and I think that, you know, going back to our basics of who we are and planting our own seeds and working in our own gardens in our own local neighborhoods and building and connecting with our locally is is how are we going to get out of this. And, it's, and I think any, you know, big global crisis like this will bring us back to our roots like that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um... Andrew or Ben, do you have any other questions that you want to ask Suzanne? I don't think so. Um, I have a question. Well, for you (laughs) guys, um, that video, Mm. (laughs) holy cats, tell me about that video. Like, what? Just a run run of the mill music (laughs) video. (laughs) No, Um, it's not. It's not run of the mill at all. (laughs) I think, I mean, one of the things I remember talking about, and I, I think it's a really cool conversation, is the the idea of, you know, what what goes on in a child's mind and how yeah. how capable they are of processing really terrifying things. Like, what are the terrifying things that kids think about? And, you know, like, I think we, like, we shelter children from so many things that we think are too scary for them. And, you know, why do we do that? And do we need to do that? Or, you know, when should we be talking to kids about death and terrifying things they don't understand. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. What's the feedback been like about the video? We got a lot of hate mail, like people thinking that we were <laughs> child abusers. They didn't didn't understand the concept that there yeah. could be child actors who were acting. Mm. <laughs> right. Uh, 
I think we we achieved our goal of wanting to thoroughly confuse and bewilder people. <laughs> yeah. I think I think you're right though. Like we do we do protect our our children and ourselves from the cycle of life. Right? That we we sort of we we're afraid of death. And I think that you know what's happening with the with the long-term care facilities is a really great example of, you know, we shovel away our old people into these old folks homes and separate them and come and see them like they don't exist. And I think that we need to re-embrace that we are all part of this. And, and even though your, your film was terrifying, um, there is a, <laughs> such a, also a heartful element of it that of reconnecting children with the dying and their grandparents and their great grandparents and watching death and watching, you know, understanding that it is one big cycle and we all are all in this together. Yeah. Well said. Well, I, I can't thank you all enough. This has been a terrific discussion. And like I said at the beginning, Ben and Andrew, this is before I even knew what a podcast was probably in 2008. This is a conversation I wanted to have. Well, I'm really <laughs> glad we got to do this. Yeah, thank it's you so a great much. it's a great song. I love your song. Thank you. It's it was a prescient. I love your work. Seems like uh, good things are going to come out of it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Matt, for bringing us together. Oh, my pleasure. Be sure to check out MGMT's latest album, Little Dark Age. And you can keep up with Suzanne Samard's work at mothertreeproject.org. Special thanks to Tanya Ellersick and Cassidy Teufel for helping out with today's episode. Sing for Science is co-produced with The Talk House. Our music is by Italian artist Panoram. Please be sure to check out our other episodes and subscribe to the show. Thanks for listening.